you guys are all. Thanks. Awesome. I hope you guys are doing well. Um, as a disclaimer, before I actually start, I want to say thank you so much for having me here and really putting together this whole conference. It's really awesome and rare to be kind of in a room with like-minded people. And this is my first time ever to St. To Louis. And I've had such a good time kind of exploring the city and seeing all the mid-century architecture that there's here, or that there is here. The flip side to that is this is my first time in a Midwestern city in the middle of spring. So if I start sniffling or if I start sneezing or coughing, please just bear with me. It's like I don't normally sound like Kathleen Turner, but we're just gonna roll with it today. Um, and you know, like if I start, if I drop along or if I pass out or something, at least it'll be on the internet for perpetuity. So you can all go back. Like, remember when that blonde girl fell down? Like, yeah, it was me. Okay, so all that aside, hi. Um, I'm here, and Mary has already introduced me, to present on uh, the 1950s ranch house interior as a cultural resource. We're looking at um, identifying the interior components and kind of evaluating uh, it as a component of, an F of a cultural resource. Okay. So the post-World War II period in the United States saw an economic prosperity and population explosion unequal to any period in American history. The Great Depression of the 1930s and wartime rationing in the 1940s led to a housing vacuum in the country. Returning veterans and their war-weary Amer and war-weary Americans wanted a space to start or wanted a space of their own to start their families and live their American dream. And what were they building in this period? It was the ranch house. Uh, the ranch house is the most prolific residential housing type in the United States. There were 1.65 million housing starts in 1955 and 1.5 million for the remainder of the decade. Nine out of 10 of these were ranch houses. So what are we talking about when we say ranch house? There is no universal definition of this house type, but you definitely know one when you see one. It's one story, long and rambling, usually has overhanging eaves, a variation in fenestration, and when possible, there is a use of natural materials. The ranch house type can incorporate many architectural styles on the exterior, but the overall footprint is fairly universal. So the preservation community has been addressing and evaluating the ranch house as a cultural resource since the early 2000s. Nationwide, many districts have been listed in the National Register for Historic Places for the ranch house's contribution to architecture, planning, and social development. Many local communities and state and federal agencies have conducted studies to identify exterior features of the ranch house and its historic context. In 2010, the state of Georgia did guidelines for evaluation of the ranch house in Georgia. Uh, this publication outlined the defining characteristics of the type in Georgia and put the ranch house in a national and state context. More recently, the National Cooperative Highway Research Program released Report 723, a model for identifying and evaluating the historic significance of post-World War II housing, which focuses greatly on the ranch house. These studies both identify characteristics and, and the significance of the ranch house exterior, but provide little insight into the interior plan or use of interior spaces. Which then begs the question, so what does the interior actually look like? What are its defining characteristics? And what is the context for the interior? Why does it actually look the way that it does? And are there any preservation challenges that could be associated with it? OK, so in order to address these questions, I examined plan, uh, published ranch house floor plans from the 1950s. Uh, publishing houses printed books and magazines, which served as guidance for prospective home buyers. These plan books offered a statistical representation of common elements within the ranch house design and social themes expressed through an idealized residential floor plan. Floor plans from 19 historic uh, plan books were used to obtain data on interior arrangements and dimensions and included graphics were used to identify commonalities in plan interiors through the decade. These plan books were from large builders, individual architects, and publishing houses nationwide and resulted in a sample size of 467 individually proposed ranch house interiors. Uh, this data was supplemented with 1950s women magazines and etiquette books in order to gauge perception about living in a ranch house and any implicit information like interior materials or livability tips. So once an idealized floor plan from the 1950s and a standard of living emerged from this data, I juxtapose this information with contemporary renovation guides and home magazines. By identifying what 21st century interior designers and homeowners consider desirable, it is easy to identify which characteristics and historic fabric are most threatened within the home. Okay, so now that we've gotten all the background out of the way, 
let's really get into the meat of things. What does this interior actually look like? What are we talking about when we say 1950s ranch house interior? What are the individual components? So regardless of exterior style or form, uh, ranch house interiors exhibit a remarkable number of similarities in spatial configuration. The most crucial and widespread of, uh, of these commonalities was a zoned living space. All of the 467 sampled floor plans exhibited some form of spatial zoning. Zoning within the ranch house grouped rooms based on function, whether public or private. Public spaces centered around work, entertaining or dining, and included rooms like the kitchen, living room, uh, whereas private spaces would be bedrooms and bathrooms and a place where one could really focus on personal development and privacy, which is what you want in the bathroom. <laughs> Throwing that out there. Uh, so two different, floor plan, uh, two different floor plan types emerged in this period. There's an open floor plan and a closed floor plan. Um, open floor plans are characterized by large communal areas with few walls or partitions. Free-flowing, unobstructed traffic patterns between living areas, kitchen, and dining areas are significant indicators of this plan type. The closed floor plan is just that. Each room is singularly defined and separated by fixed wall partitions and provide a greater sense of enclosure. Uh, this plan maintains a more rigid traffic pattern than the open plan, but still utilizes zoning. Overwhelmingly, uh, the open floor plan was the most represented in the sample, with 68% using this form. This shows an acceptance of this new interior style, and the adaptability of this plan allowed for growing families. Flexibility in room function was a necessity in the ranch house because of size limitations. The average interior grew from 11, 1114 square feet in 1950 to 1,272 square feet in 1955, reaching 1,356 by 1959. Okay, let's walk into our ranch house, shall we? Um, so there are four distinct designs uh, that were presented in published floor plans uh, in order to get actually into the house. A foyer, a hallway, a vestibule, or direct entry into the living room. Uh, two entries were common into the ranch house interior design. A vestibule, which was 35% of all surveyed plans, and uh, walking directly into the living room, which was 34%. Now, a study conducted in 1956 by the Department of Housing and Urban Development found that female homeowners wanted a screened-off area where guests could remove wet clothing and dripping umbrellas before entering the house. A vestibule entrance was the result of a functional necessity both for housekeeping and for living. And I guess if you had a living room entry, you just had sopping wet floors when it was raining. So, these living rooms. These are the most publicly used space in the home, um, and they embodied a number of shapes and sizes as well as flexibility in use. No single example can define the standard living room. Its purpose was to be kind of a catch-all for family activities. It was an area that could incorporate all functions of daily life, an area for leisure, for personal development, and for work activities. Uh, it really did serve as the heart of the home. Now, because the importance of the living room in terms of successful livability within the ranch house, 16 possible locations for the living room were documented in the sample. The location of the living room was crucial to, the efficient, to an efficient traffic pattern in the home, and especially when paired with the dining room, constituted a large portion of the overall plan. Now, the widespread use of the open floor plan in the 1950s ranch house decreased the number of formal dining rooms over the decade. In lieu of a set-aside or formal space, a dining area was often integrated into the living room. Uh, the integration of these two spaces resulted in an L shape, and occasionally iron trellises or half walls were used to suggest a separation between these spaces without fully closing them off. This new living dining area was not only cheaper for consumers, but reflected the informality associated with 1950s residential living. Now this is what I consider the most important room in the house, but maybe they didn't. Uh, the kitchen. Uh, this was another space that received a lot of scrutiny from potential home buyers. Historically known as a utilitarian space, the kitchen was integrated into the overall living space as a response to social trends. Kitchens became less work focused and viewed more as a place for family interactions. Several kitchen arrangements were available in the 1950s to meet the needs of the individual homeowner. There was a U-shaped kitchen. Okay, I'll try to do that with my hands. There's a U-shaped kitchen uh, that had uh, counters on three sides, the range, refrigerator, and sink in kind of a triangle work pattern, an L-shaped kitchen, which would have the range and refrigerator on one side and the sink on kind of the short arm, a corridor kitchen with two parallel counter spaces with a door on either end, an entry point on either end, and the Pullman kitchen where the sink, range, and refrigerator would all be located on one wall. Did that work? Okay. <laughs> okay, excellent, thanks. All right. Um, so because of the variation in possible design the and the focus on informal living, 
Floor plans often incorporated some dining area within the kitchen themselves. Now the names of these spaces varied, but included breakfast nook, dining alcove, or snack space, and were present in 59% of sampled floor plans. Despite the trend towards more informal living and dining during this period, utilitarian spaces were still a necessity. These included areas for laundry preparation, mechanical equipment, or other basic household activities. Often these spaces were located adjacent to the, the kitchen or when applica applicable in the basement. Private spaces. So zoned away from public uh, living quarters, the bedroom was a space for individual expression, development, and respite. The most common number of bedrooms per house was three, with one larger than the others. By mid-decade, this was referred to as the master bedroom. Uh, the versatility of the ranch house plan was showcased through the bedrooms. Often two were labeled expressly as bedroom, and the third labeled as den or bedroom. Now, regardless of how they were labeled, these rooms served as a place of privacy and individual reflection. 61% of plans had one full bath with toilet, tub, and sink at a minimum. Um, and as houses became larger, half baths and second full baths were incorporated by the end of the decade. Pink bathrooms. Um, so the ranch house interior is not just about layout or spatial configuration. When imagining a 1950s interior, images of bold color choices and space agey materials come to mind. Now this housing type really came of age in a period when the building industry was experimenting with new materials that rose out of the war effort, including plastics and aluminums. Decorative laminates like formica, melamine coated paper like arborite, and vinyl products were produced in bright colors and intricate patterns. Uh, wood paneling was a popular choice and replaced traditional painted walls, and wall-to-wall -wall carpeting was available in countless patterns and colors. Uh, because the options were so, so variable to home buyers, interior details were really left to the discretion of the individual homeowner. But you gotta believe me on this one, they were very, very colorful. Bubblegum pink, starburst yellow, I mean it's all, it's all in there. Um, and that's something else, you know, not only is it, you know, fancy wallpapers and bright colors, something that in talking to just people on the street about ranch house interiors is, you know, oh, tell me what you think about ranch house interiors. It's like, oddly shaped rooms and no storage space. It's like, that's absolutely correct, no storage space. So something that uh, developers and builders would do would be uh, to incorporate the use of built-ins. And built-ins kind of would be, uh, could vary from bookcases to vanities to china hutches, trying to maximize the, not compact, but the, um, the humble size of the, place, the 50s ranch house. So the final characteristic of the interior space is their relationship to the exterior. Fenestration is a notable defining feature of the ranch house in general, but play a crucial role in establishing interior spaces. Large picture windows were a popular feature, which allowed sunlight to permeate living spaces. These, paired with full-length side and glass doors, allowed interior and exterior spaces to meld, making the humble ranch appear much, much bigger. So just as an overview and a generalization, the typical 1950s ranch house interior had three bedrooms and one bath, an open floor plan, an eat-in kitchen area, a large living room with an integrated dining room, and large amounts of glass which brought the outdoors into the interior. And that's all well and good. So We've, we've identified the interior characteristics, but what does this mean in terms of post-war residential living? In comparison to previous forms of American housing, the qualities expressed by the ranch house interior became associated with efficient, sensible, and modern living. The casualness expressed through ranch house floor plans can be seen in the omission of formal spaces. This idea and the integration of exterior spaces allowed for an in, a more informal approach for activities in the home and during entertaining. The emphasis on the relaxed appeal of the ranch house and publication and plan books was a reaction against the rigidity of previous generations and an embrace of the perceived informality of post-war America. The ranch house was designed to facilitate a more casual lifestyle. Now, in an era that valued conformity on a social and political level, the ranch house allowed consumers to express their individuality through plan selection, material use, and decoration. Ranch houses were often individualized by particular home buyers and adjusted to meet homeowner specifications. Variations in interior and exterior elements meant that, housing, that a housing form that was mass produced could be altered to create a unique, unique structure for each buyer. Okay. This is my favorite slide. Um, so a component of this individuality was the fact that ranch houses emphasized a family-centric space, one which was malleable to meet the needs of specific families. Single-story living and an open floor plan resulted in less separation of family members and more interactions overall. A common theme in 1950s periodical was the role of women in the home, often depicted as wife and mother. 
New interior materials meant quicker completion of mundane household chores, and new appliances like washer and dryers meant mothers could spend more time with their family. Um, sure. Uh, the expectation that mothers would be omnipresent within the house was promoted by the open floor plan and the integration of the kitchen into the bigger living area. Uh, with all public rooms seen easily from the kitchen and large expanses of glass to the exterior, supervising the children was possible while completing household tasks. The informality and casualness expressed in the interior allowed children more freedom to the entirety of the house. Since work and play took place in the same area, spaces were no longer secluded for adults and the most important spaces belonged to all. Now, the open floor plan and this family-focused lifestyle did not necessarily mean a constant barrage of 1950s together time. Um, the 1950s housing standard, actually, it did s seek to promote family togetherness, but really understood the need for private time. Uh, zoning was really the solution for this and provided a space for adults to retire from the children. And I'm going to go off book just for one second here. Uh, I love this slide so much because I the idealized version of the family is like, look how happy everyone is. We're hanging out with the kids and she's cooking and all this. And then you look at the real woman's face. <laughs> Here's my question, and this is why I love this photo so much. How many times do you think that woman told that little girl not to mess with that button on her coat? Does this woman look like she needs five minutes away from these kids and just like to lay down and have a moment of private reflection? Like, I love that face is amazing. Anyway, yeah, we're back. Um, okay, so uh, the central role of children and their changing needs over time uh, prompted a need for flexibility within the ranch house. Designers and homeowners felt that the house should grow and be built in stages as, as needs and means of the family grew. This can be seen in multiple additions and alterations that occurred over subsequent decades. Although many builders touted the benefits of additions as the family grew, they, rever they rarely, if ever, talked about disrupting the original floor plan or the layout of the house. Which then leads us to preservation challenges. So there are two overarching preservation challenges that the ranch house interior faces. Those associated with recent past resources and the preservation of privately owned interiors. Now the ranch house interior faces a lack of appreciation as a potential significant cultural resource. And this stems from the fact that these resources were built little over 50 years ago, and many in the public have a hard time viewing them as historic. These interiors are seen as dated and outmoded, which increases the public's marginalization of them. And the fact that these houses are everywhere may lead some to believe that they will exist in perpetuity, which is absolutely not the case. Um, there are estimates that approximately 75,000 ranch houses are demolished or raised each year to make room for larger kind of McMansion type homes. Now design books and renovation guides also pose a threat to these interiors. They show an inconsideration to the interior and a general unknowing about its significance and to the overall integrity of the ranch house. Articles advocate complete demolition of interior spaces because demolition can work as a great reorganizing tool. Uh, another challenge associated is the loss of historic materials. The large-scale industrial manufacturing processes and equipment used to make these post-war materials are now obsolete or non-existent, making mid-century materials virtually impossible to replicate. As they are difficult and expensive to reproduce and stylistic tastes change, some current ranch house owners opt to replace historic interior elements with modern materials. The challenge that material loss in the 1950s ranch house is particularly alarming because these materials cannot be recreated once removed. This and these materials may have the potential to be hazardous. Asbestos is a miracle, right? Um, a full analysis of material composition is needed to evaluate the best method of removal or preservation. Okay, so the best method preservationists can employ to protect this, uh, for the protection of these components is really a massive public awareness building. Since there is little recourse for interior preservation in general, allowing the public to make informed decisions about their interiors can ensure the longevity of these components. Presenting accurate information and compatible alterations in a comprehensible manner on a large scale, like via the internet or mass communications or something, uh, may produce homeowners or may introduce homeowners to interior changes perhaps not before recognized. Educating the public to the significance of the ranch interior spaces may make them relatable to the individual homeowner and perhaps prevent irreversible damage or alteration. The home as an entity really is meant to adapt over time to suit the needs of the inhabitant. 
Changes in familial demands and standard of living alter the overall perception of an acceptable home interior. This does not mean that existing interiors should be discounted or are as insignificant or destroyed, but rather they should be taken into careful consideration when planning for interior alterations and sympathetically modified. The interior of the home really must be malleable to meet the need of the particular homeowner. That's all I got. <laughs>